Hi, this is Brittany Bond, reporting live from Copenhagen in my living room. I just took Afro for a walk on the beach at Sunday morning. Oh, so another beautiful day in paradise. If you hear any chickens, it's because <laughs> where my community space is, it is right next to a chicken farm. Um, so we're rolling with that. We're rolling with it. Um, today I want to talk about being in tribe and what does that mean and why do we all crave it so much? So for me, a lot of this started, like they say, they say our biggest heartaches are the biggest gifts that we can give the world. And for me, I know that I was, I could either crumble from all the things that happened to me as a kid, or I could choose to make it one of my biggest gifts. And I wish I was raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, if you didn't know this. Um, and there's like different levels of that. It's a Christian religion. And the reason why I'm talking about it is because it relates to the community building. So in, in that religion, there's different levels of like, I guess, intensity of it around the world, like different places. It's all around the world where I grew up. Ironically, it's, I grew up in Northern California where I went to a public school and a lot of other Jehovah's, like, it's pretty normal to go to a public school if you're raised a Jehovah's Witness, but you're made to feel like you're not allowed to hang out with anyone who you go to school with. They call it being in the world, but being not of the world. So people who are not Jehovah's Witnesses, we are programmed to believe that they are called worldly people, as in not to be trusted. Everyone inside of the religion we call them brothers and sisters, as in they are part of our family and they are to be trusted. There's a lot of fault in this, of, of course. I'm sure that you're already thinking. Um, because for many years, I didn't understand how to trust people after I left. I just kind of had this baseline feeling of feeling unsafe around people because of this deep programming since I was born. I mean, my great-grandparents were Jehovah's Witnesses until they died. And my great-grandma died when she was 102. And my other great-grandma died when she was 97. I love them. <laughs> my great-grandma Bond is amazing. Anyway, it's a different story. Um, so I love my family. And I love the people within the religion. And I felt very much on a somatic level. So somatic means experiencing whatever sensations you're experiencing in your body. So from a somatic level... I very much knew how it felt to be in tribe. And so like if, like I always tell people, you know, my summers growing up were spent uh, visiting the older ones in our church and spending time with them or babysitting the, the other kids of the church, you know, or doing different volunteer programs. We would build a whole church in one weekend. I know that sounds crazy, but my dad owns a construction company in California. And so he was one of the main people that would lead on these projects. And they would plan everything ahead of time, buy the land, and then all of us as volunteers would spend two days and we would build out a church that could host um, up to 300 people in it. And it was beautiful, you know, it was a really beautiful church. It was also really beautiful to come together because we had so much fun. We used our collective energy to connect to each other and to focus that energy on a project that was something that we all cared about. So... All of these things were things that were kind of built into me, right? I knew how to work within a tribe. I also saw from a very deep somatic level, deep sensations in my body, how unsafe I felt because also built into this religion is that um, at any moment someone can tell on you that you're not doing something you're not supposed to and then you can get kicked out of the religion. They call it being disfellowshipped. And that means that if that happens to you, then they announce it from the stage in front of everyone. And then at, from that point onward, everyone is supposed to act like you don't exist, like literally walk right by you and you're a ghost. And in order for you to come back into the tribe, come back into the religion and the church and the community, you have to keep coming to the church meetings that happen two or three times a week and sit there quietly, make sure you study the articles that are being studied that week. And then within six months or a year, the elders, they call them the elders, the church leaders will determine from observing you, whether they find you to be repentant enough in order to be allowed back into the community. Whew, that's a lot, right? So the reason why I'm telling you all of this is because I learned the very beautiful sides of community and being in tribe, and I also learned the very edge of the shadow, of the dark sides of being in tribe. 
So I know both of these very well, and I've been on both sides of them. I was disfellowshipped within my community when I wanted to be divorced from my husband. I got married when I was 18. Uh, it wasn't an arranged marriage. A lot of people ask me that, but it was, you know, I grew up with an abusive father who, when I went to the church leaders and told them that he was abusing us, he, they told us, oh, uh, well, my dad, like, my our parents beat us too. It's okay, you know, as long as you're following what he says, he should be fine. Like, this is the kind of re programming that I was around, and my mom also had to fall in line like women don't have that much of a say like in within the religion the husband is the head of the household and you do what he says and above that it's the church leaders that are the head so there's a very patriarchal hierarchy that happens and women are not allowed to teach from the from the church platform um, there's many things that women are not allowed to do in the church so me being the middle child of two sisters who were two years older and younger. I was the only one who would speak up in my family that, you know, stuff was going really bad with my dad and um, that, yeah, I wasn't happy at home. But for me, having the church in as part of, basically, my dad was so abusive that when we would come home from school, we wouldn't be allowed to leave the house until we left the next day for school. So I wasn't allowed to hang out with anyone or, you know, we had a backyard that we were allowed to play in or hang out in. I wasn't allowed to like, hang out with any friends, even people from the church. So this is not normal, according to Trove's witnesses. This is just my dad's own crazy controlling self. Um, and so the religion actually was the only opportunity for me to be allowed to be in community. Um, so for me, it was like a safe haven. And I really wanted it to be my tribe. I even like, you want the, you know, sometimes you just, like when people ask me, like when people find out, oh, Brittany's a Jehovah's Witness, because I was also leading a lot of stuff in school and like very active and everything I cared about. And they were like, I don't get how you're a Jehovah's Witness because <laughs> how do you believe this? And I just had this kind of like split in my programming of my brain where I was like, I have to believe this because this is part of my community, even though it didn't feel good in my body. So anyways, I got married when I was 18 to get out of the household that I was in. Uh, I had moved out and lived with some other friends who were Jehovah's Witnesses, um, but I didn't really have enough. I didn't know enough about the outside world. Again, I wasn't allowed to really go outside or like experience the outside world in many ways, except for whatever my dad chose he thought was okay for us. I We weren't really allowed to watch TV unless it was like approved by him. And so, but I had read all of the books that I could get my hands on in the library. And this is not really something that Jehovah's Witnesses approve of because, you know, could be stuff in there they don't want you to see. But my dad really liked to read. So this was kind of a thing that him and I had together. And so he allowed me to read whatever I wanted. And my parents didn't realize that I was reading everything. I was reading like stuff about sexuality. I was reading stuff about business. And my dad was an entrepreneur. And so I picked up a lot of stuff from him. But when I moved out of his house, I didn't have the means to support myself. I didn't understand how the outside world worked enough to support myself. And so... <laughs> Oh, it's so funny. So then I got married and then I wanted to get divorced within a year because I, I loved my husband as a person, but I wasn't in love with him. And also when you're 18, how the fuck do you know who you want to be with the rest of your life? And in the religion, you have to stay with the person you're married to. They even have a thing where after you both die, you're going to be resurrected into a paradise on earth that will happen and then you'll be married then. So literally you're married and you'll get together forever. The only way to get out of this situation is if someone cheats on someone, someone sleeps with someone else or one of you dies in this lifetime and then the other person can remarry. They don't really comment on like if you remarry <laughs> and someone dies, like what happens to you in paradise? Like, do you have two wives or two husbands? No, they don't really go into that. They just want to control you in this, this 3D timeline, which is whatever. So I didn't know enough about my own rights as a woman, as a human being, that I could even speak up and my my feelings and my thoughts were valid enough. And so I stayed in a marriage for six years that I knew I wanted to be out of by, consciously I knew by one year I really wanted to be out of it. So I stayed for five more years. I started getting so depressed that I had to get on antidepressants and I couldn't get out of bed. I, it was like the only time in my life that I've actually been like overweight because I was just so unhealthy and so ha unhappy and so not following my joy. 
and then I talked to, I finally like uh, talked to someone who allowed allowed within my reality a therapist who was also one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So like therapy wasn't really recommended for people outside the religion, as in like having a therapist outside the religion again because it's a cult, and so they don't want you having any thinking of any input that might show you that this reality tunnel is fucked up. So the most ironic thing to me is. I got a therapist who was a Jehovah's Witness, but he was uh, based in New York City. And this is back in like 2012. So we would do Skype calls once a week. And it took him about three years for him to help me understand that my rights actually mattered. And, and so I sat down with my ex-husband and I said, I like, you know, I just said, okay, I don't want to be married anymore. I don't, I'm not cheating on you. I don't have anyone on the side. I just don't want to do this anymore. And he <laughs> he was just like, no, no, no. And then he started like throwing things and being crazy. And I was just like, okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> so then I left and I packed my bag and I thought, okay, I'm going to go and da, da, da. Anyways, I got divorced from him. I was working in a law firm at the time. And so I wrote my own divorce decree and I... After we got divorced, I I realized that within the religion, even when you get yeah, <laughs> so fucked up, even when you get um, divorced within the religion, like from a government standpoint, you're still considered spiritually married to that person. So I didn't care about this because I wasn't I I was already losing my faith in this religion, but I realized that for him he wouldn't be able to actually remarry unless he found out that I was with someone else. And so in other cases within this religion, people have hired private detectives to follow around their exes so that they, like, so say like him and I got, get, got divorced, right? And then he would have to find out whether I was with someone else and prove it to the church leaders in order for him to be allowed to be remarried. And I was like, no, we're done. We're going to be done all the way. So I ended up sleeping with a friend of mine, having sex with a friend of mine, and then telling the church leaders I slept with this person because I wanted to be completely done with the marriage. And then they told me, okay, within a week, we are going to disfellowship you. And you have basically you have one week to let your family know that you are not going to be with them anymore. My mom came to where I was living. She acted like I was dying. She like cried through the last church meeting that I was there as like a fully full Jehovah's Witness. And I just remember thinking, like, what the fuck is going on? Like, how is this real love? How is this, like, you know, at the time I was following what Jesus believed, and I was like, how is this Christ-like love, you know, like, to separate us from our family? And so they announced from the platform that week that, like, Brittany Bond is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And then for two years, I went to church meetings every single week with people just walking right by me and acting like I didn't exist because the church leaders told them that that was what would encourage me to come back was to completely cast me out. And I did it because I wanted to be with my family again. And I was so stressed out from the whole experience. It was so traumatizing for me that I got uh, what you call, um, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's, it's um, <laughs> what is the name for it? It's basically the same strain as chicken pox. I'll remember it in a second. It doesn't matter. Basically, I got a really bad infection that I had to be on like morphine pills from because my body was like, this is unsafe. This is not healthy. This is not being in tribe, right? When I when I got back in, when they announced Brittany Bond is now a Jehovah's Witness, um, then this is where the really interesting part happened for me was all of the frustration and anger and like the the body sensations, the somatic experiencing that I had been shoving down by being in survival mode in order to get back in, in order to be with my family. Like you have to imagine my whole, both sides of my family, everyone is in there. Every person I'd ever cared about growing up, my whole reality was in this religion because this is how they frame it. You're not actually supposed to talk to anyone else. And all of a sudden I was back in and like people... I thought like people would like be like hugging and running and screaming and talking, you know, like so excited to talk to me. And the reaction I got was, well, we want to just like my friends, my mom, my family, they were like, well, are you actually, you know, back in all the way? Like, let's just observe you for a while and make sure that you are really 
believing the things because we don't want to get tainted. You know, we don't want to be around. They, they call it bad association. And then I got really angry and I was like, this is not okay. This is not how family treats each other. This is not how tribe t- treats each other. This is not the community that I want to be in anymore. I cannot dedicate my life f- to this. And so at 24 years old, I walked away. And I walked away from my whole family and my tribe and everything I'd known, you know, and it was just like black. It was like a clean cut. And a lot of people, when I tell, there's more to the story, like my ex-husband tried to kill himself twice. There's so much. And the whole time I was like, no, I deserve better than this. I choose a reality where I'm around people who love me for just being me, for existing and for the frequency that I am on, whether it's up, down, sideways that day, they can see me, they can see my soul, and they believe in that, and they trust that, and they love that. And then everything I do, you know, in the external reality is great, you know? I don't need to do anything in order to be in tribe. This is the reality that I'm choosing. At the same time, I started traveling uh, with a co-living co- travel company that I was helping launch, and we were traveling all over the world building digital nomad communities. So if you don't know what digital nomad is, it's people who work remotely online and choose to choose to travel for most of the year, I would say. So I, at the, this is like 2014, 2015, like remote work, digital nomads was such a brand new thing. And so the communities were so, there was no community. And so we would travel to Italy and Croatia and, you know, all of these spots all over Europe and South America and then into Asia. And most of them, they would maybe have a co-working space, but the locals who were running the co-working space, they didn't know how to run it. They didn't know how to do community especially not for people who are international, right? So I just stepped in and I started helping them. I was like, okay, this is this is what we like. Let's do a little meetup. Let's like meet the, have the locals meet us. Let's do like a, a program in the community where we can do social impact. So I started doing this community building everywhere I went because I wanted to have it for myself. I wanted to have a community that I felt good in. And it just it just really took off. It, it exploded around the world like and I'm not saying that I'm the only one. This is like, uh, there's a group of us, a very small group of us who I would say are the ones who started most of these communities and we're all really good friends to this day. And um, and then when I got to Chiang Mai in Thailand, in the north of Thailand, I was like, oh, okay, this feels like home. Like this is the first place where I like want to stay for a while. And so I still kept traveling around the world, but I would stay longer and longer in Chiang Mai every year. And then eventually I would keep my house there and rent it out. So I would actually feel at home there. So when people ask, like, they're always like, where are you from? I'm like, I'm originally from California, but I also haven't lived. The last time I lived in California was, <laughs> like, full-time was 2008. So uh, I would say the longest I have lived anywhere outside of that is Thailand. I've been here since 2016. And so we're coming up on almost seven years of me living here and basing here. Um, before COVID, I was still traveling for at least half the year but my community was here. This is like where I put my energy into. And for a lot of it, it was Chiang Mai and it was around digital nomads. I, I have since <laughs> stepped away, maybe not stepped away, but like my interest is less focused. My interest is less focused on digital nomads and remote working and more focused on building a real tribe, building a real community of people where we feel dropped in, where, where we feel safe to actually be ourselves and safe to let everything move through us and release all this old programming and honor it and release it. And then and then a place that I I feel safe to have my own kids into one day, you know? Like I want my kids to be my kids I choose my kids to be raised in community because I know how it feels to be raised in community and to have lots of aunties and uncles and lots of kids running around and you know when my dad had cancer when I was seven and he was in the hospital for a long time it was the first time my mom had to work and we would be passed around through a lot of the other families in the in the religion after school we would go to different people's houses and it wasn't really that big of a deal for us like for I mean of course it was a big deal my dad was in the hospital and we were all worried about him he got better he was okay um but at the time the feeling of you know I'm just trying to imagine like what my mom would have done with three little girls 
uh, if we didn't have the religion, you know, like would she have had a community where she knew that every single day we could get dropped off at so-and-so's house and there would be a community of people there, you know, there would be people to welcome us and love us and kids to play with and co-regulation. Co-regulation is where you share each other's energy and you balance out each other's nervous system. So, yeah. So this podcast, I want to talk a little about my yeah my story around tribe, and then also why I'm, I'm so, so it feels so important for me to build this tribe. Um, and something that I I really want to like, <laughs> really really imprint on everyone who's listening to these episodes is the thing about co-regulation. So something I learned through a lot of my uh, trauma awareness training and somatic experiencing and like different things, tools I picked up over the years, like studying all of this, studying psychology, studying the body and everything, is this thing around co-regulation. So a lot of people know about self-regulation. And that's when we, you know, something happens, either good or bad, that spikes us up or brings us down. And then self-regulation is where we can regulate our own nervous system. So we can get to, wow, talk about nervous system I'm gonna breathe for a second I'm like getting so excited about this episode that I'm like (sighs) because when we speak our vibration is also sharing our nervous system with whoever's listening right so I invite you to breathe with me for a second (laughs) I know this is like maybe this is my podcast so invite enjoy enjoy so I invite you to take a deep breath or to settle I'm sitting right now in a cross-legged position but you can do whatever you want, sit in a position that feels good, Uh, or stand, whatever you're doing. (laughs) Uh, Just come into full presence with your body, and then let out whatever air you have, and then breathe in with me. And when you breathe in, expand your stomach, so your stomach goes out, and then breathe in the air all the way up your chest, and all the way through your head, and out of your head. And hold it for one second. And then when you let it out, sigh as much as you can. I'm going to pull the mic away because I'm going to sigh. Every time we do that is an opportunity for us to drop into our bodies. And this is the point of us being on these timelines is to drop into our bodies. So self-regulation is where we all have a baseline of energy or emotion, right? And you can also change that baseline. If it's the one that you don't like, you can change it. For me, I know that when I'm alone and I'm by myself and with, especially with my dog, little Afro, my baseline joy, my baseline emotion is joy. So if something is outside of that, then I know that I have been affected by other people's energy or a situation that brings up something that is a limiting belief or whatever, whatever, whatever. So I can sit here and self-regulate, which is fine. I have tools and resources for this. And when you come to this island, when you come to Copenhagen, there's many things, um, uh, uh, facilitated workshops and experiences to learn these tools and resources and I'm also building some retreats to kind of like package these so people can really feel into them. And like, I want them to have the same resources that I have, you know? So those are great. I think that's important to have, you know, self-regulation tools and resources. There's something called co-regulation. So this comes from the, it stems from the story of like when you're a baby. A lot of people don't realize this, but from the ages of zero to about six months, and it can go up to three years, but zero to six months is the f- zero <laughs> when you're first newborn to six months is a time when babies can literally not self regulate their nervous system. So they're fresh. They're just like coming from the spirit, coming into the body, and they're like open. They're like on a shit ton of mushrooms, right? Like they actually say that when you're a baby, your pineal, your pineal gland, which is like where your people th- think of like your third eye, like in the middle of your forehead. That, and um, that is actually open a lot when you're a baby. So you actually, they've proven that like DMT is being released when you're a baby. This is why babies look like they're tripping all the time, right? Also, they're super open to their environments from a nervous system standpoint. So when a baby cries, 
they literally cannot self-regulate their nervous system. And this is why parents put them on their chest and mat so that so the baby feels and hears the heartbeat of the parent. And then they literally match up their heartbeat with their parents. And this is called co-regulation. So this and this is also why a lot of times we're imprinted with our parents a little bit fucked up nervous system, right? Which is fine. We have tools to deal with that. But what people don't realize is that when you are growing up and especially in as adult, like a lot of this co-regulation gets put into the box of sexuality. As in someone is listening to me, someone is interested in me, maybe they want something from me, oh, they're, they want to hold my hand or, you know, whatever, touch me in some way, in a consensual way. But all of these things are put in the box of maybe they want to sleep with me or maybe they want something from me. I live in a reality, I choose a reality of my tribe where we are co-regulating all day long. So, you know, <laughs> just in the middle of this podcast now, I had a friend of mine call me and he has something ongoing that he's dealing with. And he's like, do you have time for co-regulation? I really honor, I've been sick this week. And he's like, I honor, you know, your energy level and all that stuff. And I was like, I'm so excited to do this podcast. And then I will call you back. You know, I'll check in with my energy and I'm happy to co-regulate if I have energy. And in that situation, all he is asking for is for me to listen and then to remind him of his connection to source energy and also to be there as a calm nervous system that's like, hey, it's okay, I, I get it, you know, I'm here, I'm with you, you are in tribe. And just having that can help a person come back to their baseline, can co help them come back to their baseline emotion and see things more from a clear standpoint. Other different ways to co-regulate, a lot of my friends and I will just hold each other's hand when we're together and just be like, can I hold your hand? And then we just talk and it is not sexual. So this is where I, when I do a lot of my events, there's a clear distinct distinction between caring touch and then everything else, which is, you know, sensual, sexual, right? Caring touch is the touch that you have in your tribe. It's giving each other a hug, cuddling, holding hands. It is given with the clear energy and intent it's shared, so it's it's energy moving back and forth between you and the person that you care about and the person that you love and the person that's in your tribe. This is so important. This is co-regulation. This is why when, like, think about how our brains and our bodies are still, in a lot of ways, imprinted with the very human part of us where, you know, thousands of years ago, if you were not in tribe, you were probably going to die like as in hunter-gatherer times if you weren't in the tribe you weren't in the, the group dynamic where you know they're fighting off whoever and whatever animals or other tribes or whatever so it's a very deep somatic like body experience of feeling very unsafe when you're not in tribe when you're not able to co-regulate and this can be um, compared to disconnection and and a lot of people, if they are alone for too long and with this feeling of disconnection, they become suicidal because we are made to connect. Like if you love Brene Brown, she's an amazing author. She says we are hardwired for connection. And in today's society, it's like someone tried to program that out of us. And I'm like, no, 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 let's wake up to the natural part of us that wants to be safe and in tribe wants to feel safe to have the energy move back and forth between us. So a lot of things that I talk about with, you know, so how do you choose who you want this energy to move back? and Like, so how do you choose who you want to be in tribe with? How do you choose, how do you select who you want to share this very precious energy that you have? Well, for me, I've had a really fun time building the community around me. I've been based on Copenhagen for over three years now. We have a community space that's been going for, wow, almost two years. Um, time flies when you're having fun. Whew, doing some deep breathing today. Yeah, I'm still upgrading, as I say, whenever I'm sick. But I'm so excited to do this podcast. So... I've had a really fun time building this community and figuring this out. So the criteria that I ask myself when I'm choosing my, my inner crew, my chosen family is what I call them, is after spending time with each person, so I decide this on a person-by-person uh, -person basis, is do I feel safe in my body around this person? 
so these are questions you can ask yourself as well for the people that are the people that you choose to share your energy with. And I want to back up a second and say, this does not mean that because maybe it's someone that you're best friends with and you've known forever, that this gets to be your chosen family. Or this doesn't mean like it's your mom or whatever. And yeah, so those are, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Those are people in your life. We're talking about chosen family, choosing the timeline of who you want to share your energy with. You get to decide. You don't have to accept whatever is happening with the people around you. You can still love them. And I call it separating with love, but we're going to go into that in a second. But this specifically is what I'm talking about is choosing your chosen family, your soul tribe, where you're super excited for the energy to flow back and forth between all of you. Okay, so some questions to ask yourself with each person. Do I feel safe in my body around this person? Do I feel more connected to my authentic self? Do I feel hosted and uplifted? Do I feel inspired to create what brings me joy or follow your highest excitement, whichever, it's the same thing. And also, this is what I think is really important too, is when I'm down on my emotional wave, is this person there with me to remind me of my joy and my connection to source energy? So when someone is down on their wave, like, you know, we're all going to have bad days. It's not good vibes only over here. It's like, the point also of being in tribe is yes to, to to keep growing and to build beautiful things in the 3d reality but and it's also for when we are down on our waves when we're i call it upgrading so for whatever reason the universe wants you to slow down to look at something and sometimes it's really important to look at those things with each other like you know it's so for me it's like my personal journey but maybe I want to call a friend and just bounce it off of them and I don't need that friend to tell me what to do I just need them to remind me like hey Brittany you know what to do you know you know like remind me of my value remind me of my connection to my source energy remind me of the path that I'm on that I've already shared with them because they they know enough about me to know my mission in life to know my value set and so they're just reminding me of what I've already chosen that is very important. And then the next one, do I feel this person has my back? Am I able to share the energy back with this person in the same way? So, yeah, these are really great questions. I, I wanted to say that this is not something that's just like popping out of thin air and I'm just like downloading. I mean, a lot of the stuff I feel like I'm downloading from the universe, most of it. And also I have tested it <laughs> and made all of the mistakes or felt really scared to speak up for what my body is saying. And so I'm telling you all of this is listen to your body, trust your body. So for me, I'm so grateful to say that I have, I have a very <laughs> amazing crew of chosen family and I intentionally bounce the energy back and forth with them all day long telling them I love them, if I see them in person, giving them hugs, receiving love and hugs, rooting each other on, hosting each other in co-regulation, and showing up for each other when it feels good, and when we can, when we have the space and the energy. And uh, a good thing, a good tip, I will say, is that in my phone, I've put for these people the word family, and then a special like heart emoji that's only for this thing next to each one of these and so when I'm feeling overwhelmed and also when I'm feeling full of joy, I just type in family on my WhatsApp and speak to one of them in, that, in this type of this chosen family group. And I also have some group chats of these people. Um, and when I do this, it feels so good. It feels like the most abundant thing in the world. And I feel so at home. I know that everything else is amazing. And if it's not currently amazing, I'm still excited about it because I know it's going to be amazing or I know it's happening for me. I, this is something I always say. Why is this happening for me? Not why is this happening to me? Everything is happening for us to help us along on our timelines. So I know everything's amazing. It just kind of brings me back to my core, which is joy. And honestly, at the end of the day, like everything else that happens in my life is like a cherry on top. Because for me, I feel like I have it already. Like I have my tribe where the energy flows back and forth and where the love flows back and forth and just keeps amplifying. And then naturally that, hap that naturally that 
creates beautiful things in the 3D because naturally we're all like helping each other in different ways and like we're all different pieces of the same puzzle and so like when we come together it's like clicking and and then we're just like oh yeah of course I can help you with this thing this is my skill set this is my superpower and you know and then they're like oh of course I can help you with that this is my superpower and we're all just these big superheroes coming together and like being our own little Avengers team <laughs> um, and doing amazing things and having so much fun all the way through. Okay, so I want to talk about some other stuff. So what about these people who are part of your blood family or people who you've grown up with and maybe you just don't resonate with as much or you just fucking love them but they're just not on the same vibration or they're just not going the same path as you? What do you do with them? Um... So a lot of people ask me, like, do you miss your family? Like I had, one <laughs> oh my God, guys, I, I, sometimes I have people like really ask me very directly, like what happened with your family? Oh my God, that's terrible. Da, da, da. I had, <laughs> I had this couple over for dinner one time. It was like this couple, like I was dating someone and I'd made dinner for everyone. And like, we're sitting down the four of us having dinner. And then they're like, so tell us about your family and I was like I don't really think this is a table conversation and I also I've already worked through it right but they were like no no we want to know so I told them a little bit and then they literally the woman reached for the man's hand like she was co-regulating with him because it was like overwhelming for her to even hear this and and then they were she was just like oh my god if that happened to me if my basically my family just like disassociated themselves from me then I would probably kill myself and I'm like okay (laughs) like what do you what one what do you say to that and also um yeah I really just didn't know what to say to that but I feel that (laughs) that I had that choice you know I could sit with it my whole life and just be like this is the thing that defines me and this is the thing that makes me so that I don't do x y and z and instead I chose to have my the biggest heartache be the biggest gift that I give the world and use it to drive my community building because I know what it feels like to not belong and I know what it feels like to belong and I want everyone to feel like they belong I want everyone that I love to be in this different this deep tribe to feel that they are in tribe and to know that they are in tribe and then I want to make a template for this and spread it across the world so other people can build their tribes that's what we're doing here on Copenhagen do I miss my family? Fuck yes. Of course I miss my family. I love them so much. I'm super close. I was used to be super close with my mom and my older sister, especially. I love my like, younger sister. My older sister and I are like best friends and she has two little girls now. And, um, I was able to meet one of them when she was a baby and like, I want to be in their lives. I want to be in their everyday lives. I want them to come visit here. I've been having these like dreams of picking up my mom from the boat here in Copenhagen and like showing her the island and having her come. And yeah, do I love them? Yes, I love them. Yes, I want them to be here with me in tribe. Like I have these visions of my mom coming. <laughs> like when you think of my mom, if you know Betty Crocker, which is like <laughs> 1950s housewife, basically that is my mom. Like she's powerhouse, artistic woman. She paints. She She's an amazing photographer. She also used to run a bakery in California just for fun. And she has recipes from like my great, great grandparents, like secret family recipes for like cinnamon rolls and like the best bread and like everything that you can imagine like when I would come home from school she would literally have like a freshly baked um plate of cookies like chocolate chip cookies she grew all of most of our food like she would have a huge garden and and like she was very spiritual she is a very spiritual woman and and like in like an earthly spiritual way like she was always like giving us herbs as kids and like taking care of us in different ways and having us like listen to our bodies and giving us really good yummy organic food um and she also (laughs) is the most amazing seamstress in the world so her and I would go to thrift stores like secondhand stores just for fun and like get all of these old dress patterns like from the 1950s like vintage and then we would go to the fabric store and get like brand new fabric and she would make me vintage clothes in two days and I loved them 
and we would like al- find other like used clothes and then like refit them together like I would be like oh I want this to be here and like can I add something here and she would be able to do all like we would basically design clothes together and she's inspired a lot of my artistic stuff that I have in my life and she always told me that I can do whatever I wanted and I think in a lot of ways she was programming me to feel the power that she didn't feel in order to get out and I'm very grateful to her for that and so yes I love I love my family um and also there's something that I'm going to talk about now is called separating with love because all of those things I say about my mom there's still a reason why she's in this religion right like she is still in fear and that's fear of losing her community fear of losing you know the life that the programming that she has like her whole reality she would have to shift and I know that it's literally breaking her brain that I'm out here living this beautiful life and also choosing not to be in the religion because the programming they have is that if you leave the religion then you're going to become homeless or a drug drug addict or something terrible is going to happen to you and then the only way to save yourself is to come back in and I'm over here like hi I'm living my best life (laughs) so the thing that I had to choose, and this is the thing, is we all get a choice. So I'm saying this to you guys. We all get a choice. So even if your family <laughs> still loves you, but they are not on the vibration that you that resonates with you, that makes you feel good, and if you still feel alone and you still feel a little bit alien around your family, know that that's actually very normal because we are in a, such a huge shift in this timeline of the human race where our generation is we I call them the we are bridging the gap between the old generation and the new generation and that means that like the reason why I say that is because there's such a dramatic shift of thinking of vibrational frequency and of what we choose to live our lives by than the generations before us you know like for instance my grandparents to my parents generation My parents, I mean, my parents grew up in a different state. They grew up in the Oregon above California. And then when they got married, they moved to California and like did something very different. For most people, you know, there isn't that much shift in the gap between the the programming and the belief system for people like a lot of probably the ones who are listening to this podcast, all of you. You are in such a big shift vibrationally from the ones that your parents have, whether it's through the food that you want to eat, through, you know, what you want to do with the earth, you know, taking care of the earth, wanting to travel, wanting to be around people who it feels good and also feeling things more. We are a lot more awake and we are a lot more in our bodies. So that means that we're a lot more sensitive. And I noticed this a lot when I went to Europe a couple months ago and I met a lot of people who were like, like I could, I could feel all of you, like where I was just like, oh yeah, you're one of us, you know, like you're, you're awake and in your body. And I would start talking to you guys and you would tell me things like, yeah, my parents want to put me on antidepressants and they just tell me, why don't I just be happy? And I'm like, but babe, maybe it's not, <laughs> maybe it's not that there's anything wrong with you. Maybe the situation is all fucked up. And this is what I realized is when I got out of whatever programming I was in, it doesn't need to be a cult or something super dramatic, like abusive situation or whatever. It can just be a vibrational difference where, you know, they are maybe a little bit more in fear or they're just very set in their ways and they just don't get it. They just don't get the things that we get. And that's okay. (laughs) And we can still love them and emanate all that love. And then there's something that we can do, which is separate from with love and I'm not saying that you need to cut them out of your lives I mean if my family would still be in my life I would love I'm here and I'm open to receiving having them in my life and I would love it so much and also I have chosen to build a reality of a chosen family around me and these are the people that I co-regulate with so you know even I I still feel very somatically and deeply in my body that there will be a day when my older sister and I my mom and I are all very close again And then I will still need to make sure that I'm co-regulating with my chosen family, with my soul tribe. And with my family, I can be this beacon of light where I can guide them out of the fear into the love. And that's something that I I really want to say with you guys that it's okay to feel alone and it's okay to feel alien. 
And it's also okay to be in tribe and to know that there is this group of people out here and we're building this physically in Copanyang. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we're building this here and it's so beautiful to be around each other and we're all just like, yeah, like feeling the same thing on the same vibration. There's this quote that's been going around on Instagram that says, be with the people who speak the same language, like vibrationally, so that you don't spend your life trying to translate your soul. So if you f resonate with that, and you feel on some level that you're still looking for your tribe, and you're still looking to feel this feeling of being dropped in, and I will tell you what it feels like to be in tribe. When you are in your tribe, Time doesn't matter. I mean, of course time matters, but I mean like you're in the now. You are dropped in. Everything that's happening is okay because you're with your people and everything extra that's amazing is just like such an amazing thing on top. But the thing that matters is just being with each other and, and, and then focusing that energy on your shared missions in life. So one thing I realize also about being in tribe is that I don't have to convince them <laughs> that it's important to build community and that it's important to come together and that it's important to do these earth missions and and to focus on the local community and integrate and like yeah like basically they have the same download we're just like catching up like oh yeah yeah I've been working on this thing oh yeah I've been working on this other piece of the same puzzle oh my god let's come together and it just feels so activating and so inspiring and so like helping us all connect to our own source energy more um that a lot of times it just makes me want to cry like a lot of times I do cry from happiness and just being because like overwhelmed from all of the joy because like ever since I was little I always felt so alone and um so alien in a lot of ways and I just remember being like no I know my tribe is I know my real fam like a lot of times I thought I was adopted and I was just like, my real family is out there and I'm going to find them and it's going to be okay and everything's going to be great and we're going to just like hang out all the time and like have so much fun. And I'm here to tell you that I have found that and I have built that and also it might be less about s searching for it and, le and more about calling it in and being the vibration of the people that you want to co-regulate with. So when I first got to Copenhagen three years ago, I had a lot of my own stuff I still needed to work through, you know, and something that I really love about this island and that I choose to do with my tribe is, this is why I say it's not good vibes only. It's not about focusing on the positivity. It's about looking at our stuff, looking at the shadow side, which is the subconscious parts of us that we try and shove down and letting it, creating a safe space for it to float to the top and to float into the light and then honoring it and letting it work through us and releasing it because there's all and then like learning from it there's these reasons why we have different things happen to us like I'm, when something happens to a friend that other people will consider negative my first question to them is well first thing is I'm here with you you're in tribe kind of like let them know I'm feeling them I'm with them and then I ask them did you learn the lesson that, that the universe is trying to teach you you know <laughs> because if we don't it's just going to keep coming in more and more dramatic ways so that's what I mean about like letting it go through and and then what happens is especially when we're co-regulating with each other and we're keeping each other awake to like what's really happening and what's going on and helping each other feel safe to be in our bodies then the lessons that the universe is trying to teach us to upgrade us and to um, help us grow and evolve and um, yeah, evolve consciousness, we can do with, with pleasure. So one download I had from my DMT trip, this, my major one I had this year was consciousness does not look at pain and pleasure in the same way that we do. So this is why it doesn't, it's, this is why a lot of like people say like, oh, we shouldn't judge whether something's good or bad because consciousness just wants us to evolve like our and so we can choose whether we grow and evolve in a pleasurable way or in a 
what you know a painful way of suffering or whatever I'm choosing pleasure from now on a lot of people don't realize that this is the choice and do you realize that this is a choice that you can grow and have it be a positive not positive a pleasurable experience a joyful experience that like for me that is such a download that I got I was like whoa I can grow and have it be fun all the way through because like so if something's not happening in your life like that you really want like oh I want more money or you know I want my tribe or whatever instead of asking yourself what do I well first ask yourself like what do I need to work through and or like what am I learning by not having this like otherwise the universe would get it give it to you because it gives you everything you need if that is not if you feel like okay I've checked in I've worked through everything I need to then this is where that what I call active trust comes in. Now it's time to just trust the universe, knowing it's coming. Because every time we question it, then we are actually creating a blockage. So then just go focus on something else that feels good in your body and feels exciting for you. Um, an analogy that someone has shared with me that I really enjoyed is like, when a woman is like seven months pregnant, um, you're not going to be constantly checking in with her and being like, oh my God, is the baby coming? Is it really? Are you sure it's coming? Like, what if something happens? Are are you doing something wrong? Maybe the baby, like, you're like, <laughs> you're just celebrating. Like, yeah, the baby's coming. Amazing. I'm so excited for you. Da, 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 da. And yes, of course, things happen to babies, miscarriage or whatever. But for the most part, people get to the point where they give birth, right? And so this is the same thing with manifesting is, when you ask for something and you're calling it in like a soul tribe know that it's coming or that you've asked your higher self for your higher mind and then trust that it's working things out behind the scenes and that every time you question it whether it's going to work or not you're actually detracting from that energy so you want to keep your body in the highest excitement the highest frequency which is love which is trust which is enjoying which is pleasure so for me, I get really focused on stuff. So I'm like, okay, I've already called this in. I've already done the work, you know. Now I need to just like not distract myself, but like focus on something else because that's that one's already done. My higher self, my higher mind is working that one out. And now I can just go have fun doing this other thing, right? And if I need to uh, work on this or do something for this one that I'm putting aside for now, it will naturally and organically and synchronistically come back into my life and I'll be able to to deal with it so (laughs) I hope you enjoyed all of this rambly ramble I don't know for me it's like that stuff it's not rambly ramble it's stuff that I care about so much and I feel that the collective is finally waking up to this I remember when I first started doing community building like 10 years ago people were like yeah but you don't make as much money as you do when you worked in a law firm like yeah me working in the law firm with a pencil skirt and high heels working in New York City was I happy no did I feel like that was my highest excitement no so this is this is my calling this is the tribe this is the thing that I care about and I'm so excited to have the people in my reality now who understand and get it and are there with me building it and just like okay let's make Kofan Yang into the first prototype of you know uh, a new society that we can live where we can have organic fruits and vegetables here we can you know be integrated in the local Thai and Burmese community we can work out all the recycling and the garbage disposal stuff and rise up together with the Thai people and the Burmese like in in empower them as well and also be in deep tribe with each other you know and co-regulate all the time and feel safe that we can have our kids here you know and and raise them (laughs) raise them in a tribe of people you know I have kids here who are my friend's kids and they've only ever lived on Kopanyang and you guys, their reality tunnel is so much more expansive. You would think living on an island, like, oh, we should get them off the islands so they can see the world. No, they are, they are, they are like downloading stuff from the universe. They're like remembering things that like it's not even possible for them to remember. And when we ask them, how do you know that? They're like, I don't know. It just came to me in a dream, or like this and that. And I'm like, are you sure you didn't just see that on YouTube or something? And they're like, no, I really just this is doesn't this just make sense and I'm like 
Wow. Okay. So this is what happens when you don't program them. This is what happens when they are conditioned with love and support and tribe they're just rocketing into interdimensional travel and it's so beautiful and I'm so grateful to be part of their lives and and to host this next generation you know so if any of this resonates with you if any and all please reach out and come visit us on Copanyang or follow me on any of the platforms that I'm on which is Instagram Facebook, I don't know, you know, just like get involved in some way or, or call someone like, like one thing my mom always imprinted me with is we choose our reality, right? And we can focus on the negative and the fear that, that the world is choosing as their theme, or we can choose our theme to be love. So if there's someone that you really love or someone that you're thinking of that just comes into your mind, that's the universe pinging you, that that is an opportunity for connection. So like reach out to them and say like, hey, I was just thinking about you. I'm sending you some positivity, sending you some love. Or it's just, you know, how are you doing? How's it going? <laughs> and keep that energy going back and forth. And then your your soul tribe will naturally grow. And remember, remember to keep checking in with your body and trust your body and what feels good in your body and who you want to co-regulate with. <clears throat> and just know that we are in this together. You know, like, a lot of times when people are having a hard time, someone will say to them, you're not alone. And for me, I'm like, whoa, our words manifest our reality. So what the universe is seeing is noticing and paying attention to when you say we, you are not alone is the thing of alone, 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 alone. So this is why I started changing it to you are in tribe now. Like this is, this is tribe, this is family, this is soul family. And I encourage you and activate you and inspire you to also use those words like you are in tribe now this is what tribe is we are building this now and yeah sometimes I feel like those kids in like the Peter Pan land that are just like out here trying to figure it out like out trying to grow a new community a new but we're not lost we're actually the most sane people and I feel that we are building a society that we can eventually have our families come back, our blood families come into, you know, like once we can hold this vibration on a more collective level, then we can bring these people that we love so much into it. And just through the vibration and through the embodiment, they will be able to see the difference and feel the difference and come into tribe as well. Okay, love you guys. This is Brittany Bond. Have an amazing day.